lecture for the next, next hour or so after this introduction. I have a much harder ta uh, task than Walney. I have to present Dan Sperber, who is a very distinguished person. You realize when someone is distinguished, you actually need notes to present them. So with, if I present myself or someone else on my app, like I can use out of my app with Dan, I actually need my notes to make sure that I mention some of the most important things he has done. Dan Sperber comes from, uh, from Paris to us. He's a research director at the CNRS in Paris. He has been visiting professor. I mean, he's still preaching anthropology, cognitive science, philosophy, different fields, and as such, he has really hold a lot of visiting professor or visiting scholar positions around the world. To name a couple of them, he has been in Cambridge at Princeton University Institute of Advanced Studies. He has been at the London School of Economics, the University of Michigan. And on Wednesday, he's actually a visiting scholar in my lab here at Vanderbilt. So <laughs> I think pretty distinguished. Uh, he's a member of the Academia Europea, not surprisingly, but he's also a member, which is actually Europeans fairly rare. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Science, which is very, really distinguished for us here, but as even more to work out of Europe where the, well, the connections are not that easy. He's winner of a couple of medals for the anthropologist, and I hope he still sees himself mainly as an anthropologist. Uh, he's winner of the Rivers Memorial Medal, which is given by the Royal Anthropological Institute in Britain, which is one of our most distinguished honors. Just like, kind of like the Field Medal of Anthropology. Something like that. And we talk, I mean, in terms of talking about a couple of books, he had really some major impact on different fields in, in, in his career, and he continues to have so. So he started early on in his first book with French structuralism, <coughs> and then he took on symbolism, which really brought a very, very different perspective on <coughs> symbolic interpretation, symbolism, and how it was done in social science at that point. So this book that we just saw the Soviet man up there, and we think symbolism he really proposes a very different perspective on things, with the main idea behind this, I don't want to go into details in this book, <coughs> is that we really have to bring cognition to bear on these symbolic systems, on anthropology in general, if you want to understand anything about cultural systems or the symbolic systems. <coughs> His quest kind of went on along these lines in, well, two different settings, I guess. One, where it takes on anthropology and it really asks and, and demands sort of a naturalistic approach, really trying to understand anthropological processes based on individual cognitive processes in the of the social environment to really take on understanding instead of just saying what well, are cultural differences and these different books like this, this really trying to understand how these processes we are studying, how they are really sort of grounded in specific, very specific materialistic processes like cognition and things like that. So again, it's of this bridging between different fields, your cognitive psychology mainly in anthropology. On that matter, he, he wrote on anthropological knowledge and his latest book, Explaining Culture, that it is a series of essays that collected, that he wrote and collected in this book, really tries to, to expand on a new approach in anthropology. Again, he took on a lot of pro a projects that were sort of counter to the, the mainstream. We think Simulation was one of them, and Explaining Culture is another one. So in mainstream anthropology, in our 101 class, Introduction to Anthropology, we very rarely talk about dance programs. In part, I think it's got the uh, the other side of the, of the ocean, but it's also it's something that's sort of counter to mainstream anthropology, yet it really, at the minimum, poses a big question to our understanding of anthropology, because there are a lot of uneasy questions asked in how to explain our theories, how to explain this, the processes we are uh, so faced with as anthropologists. Shifting now to very not very different field, but also he, his main work probably, not of this is of his, the big thing that he starts thinking about when he thinks about himself is his, his work on relevant theory, which has had a major impact in linguistics, social linguistics, and anthropology. Again, posing a very, very different question, again, coming from a cognitive perspective, uh, uh, posing different questions to linguistics that haven't been asked in that way and at least pose some uneasiness. But by now, I think the relevant theory is pretty much mainstream in linguistics, so it really has taken over the fields. I could go on and on. I mean, had a couple of edited books that really made major impacts in cognitive science, like uh, Cause of Cognition that he had co-edited, he had a book that co-edited on uh, meta representations. All books that have really been almost sort of, uh, well, uh, past uh, signs of landmark books uh, to say that shows of the past both anthropology and the cognitive science. So it's a very interesting work and an extremely rich body of research. And again, I mean, the, it really brings together very different fields 
and this demand for really natural, you know, naturalizing our anthropology by grounding it in individual minds, bringing together the, bringing the cognition, what we know about cognition, to bear on what we think we know about anthropology. Really trying to explain much more, in much more concrete terms, what we normally sort of theorize in what one could actually call meta theories, because we really don't ground our theories much in individual cognitions, individual behaviors, individual thought and emotions, things like that. So I could go on and on, but I rather hand over to Dan Sperber and look forward to this talk. So please join me up. Thank you very much for these kind, kind words of introduction. I've got all these electrical things on me, which I'll try to hide as much as I can. Uh, okay. Well, let me move to my own part of the presentation. Uh, we'll just repeat the same thing. I want first to uh, thank the people who invited me, uh, the Center for the Study of Religion and Culture and the uh, Templeton uh, foundation who is financing this lecture. It's a real pleasure, an honor to be here. Uh, um, and I, I thought I would, by way of introduction, explain a bit where I come from, but I've been introduced already more uh, than you probably wanted to hear. Um, but I will, I will go be, be, be even a bit more personal and talk about uh, uh, Oh yes, no. talk first about my website, because all the questions that I won't have time to answer here, I have an answer on my website where I try to put up my writings. I'm, a, I'm one year late, but I will, a number of papers I will add soon. Um, and I want to talk also, and so that's, you have seen all that, so we are today doing the first lecture, which is asking the right questions, I mean, or some of them, I hope. Um, and I want to talk about my father. Uh, uh, because it's partly because of him that I'm here. My father was born in a, a, a Jewish shtetl in, in Eastern Europe, uh, in, in a Hasidic family, and uh, he was uh, a, a child prodigy, and so everybody expected him to become, a, like some of his ancestors, a miraculous rabbi. Uh, but when he was uh, 13, uh, uh, he was, there were then refugees in Vienna, uh, uh, and uh, he, he refused to do his bar mitzvah, uh, which in such a family was not a, me a small thing. Uh, I, this is, uh, by the way, the, the uh, first book of his memoirs. He's, he's, he was a writer where he's telling about the, this, uh, uh, the life in the shtetl and this Jewish childhood. So he refused to do his bar mitzvah. By then he had lost faith or, uh, 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 and... Uh, uh, and so I was brought up as a, as a pure atheist by both. My, my mother was also an atheist. Uh, and, and that was kind of taken for granted. And I, I am an atheist. And uh, I'm not a militant one, but I think it's the right way to go. Uh, but but the, the thing about the education from my father was that, on the one hand, he was indeed an atheist. But he, he did talk a lot about his background and about uh, his Jewish background, about pure religious people in general. And he did always that with uh, the greatest respect. And so part of the reason why I became an anthropologist was to kind of bring together uh, these two uh, uh, parts of my education. On one hand, that uh, no, uh, have, you know, there are no good grounds to, to be religious oneself. But yes, people are, uh, um, are, are perfectly uh, uh, good and intelligent and, and by people. And so it's not a, a kind of simple explanation of why they, they, they don't uh, see the light of atheism. Uh, um, uh, uh, and, and therefore, I uh, was really puzzled and, and, and wanted to explain that just as a character in one of his novels, who is the son of a rabbi, is secretly while he should be studying the Torah, reading Hegel to understand why all these goyims can be so mistaken. So I've been <coughs> interested in, uh, in studying uh, religion uh, uh, in, in the same vein. A and uh, indeed, I'm sorry to, uh, I, I did play a certain role. In, in the development of uh, his cognitive approach to religion with this f f f first book. I didn't choose the cover, by the way, and I don't particularly like it, too many symbols, because part of the book on symbolism was to argue that symbols per se don't matter that much. Um, the, the, um, this contributed to what has been a kind of new uh, development in, in, in the study of religion, that this cognitive approach to religion so well illustrated in the work of uh, Pascal Boyer and, and, and Scott Aitken, <laughs> both of whom have been uh, informally students of mine. Uh, uh, and and uh, in, uh, later, I gave a Malinowski lecture 
1984, where I argued for what I've been trying to develop since, kind of epidemiological approach to culture, trying to understand uh, what causes ideas, practices, artifacts, and so on to, to become uh, w widespread. Uh, and, I, uh, uh, and this lecture is republished in this book, Explaining Culture. And, and there, I, if you look at these uh, uh, various approaches to, to religion, which uh, give an important role to cognition and see cognition as a, uh, in, in evolutionary terms, as an evolved set of capacities that human beings have, qua human beings, uh, uh, there is a kind of bifurcation between uh, uh, those who see a re a religion uh, of a disposition to, uh, as based on a kind of disposition for religious thinking and see it as, a, 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 as an adaptation, as something having, uh, fulfilling some kind of function uh, in, uh, in, in human uh, affairs. Uh, uh, and uh, the other line which I, I uh, tried to uh, argue for, uh, uh, and which is that uh, religion has a side effect, uh, effect of, of disposition that humans have, uh, 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 not meeting a kind of need that would pre-exist it or not fulfilling a function uh, in a proper sense, uh, but rather has uh, um, be, being a side effect of a disposition which have, which makes us highly susceptible uh, uh, to religious ideas and practices and so on. As they make us highly susceptible, I will make the same argument for music, so I don't mean, mean anything disparaging or negative in saying that. But so, so you, if you look at this literature uh, on, uh, say, evolutionary cognitive approaches to religion, there's this bifurcation between those who look for the function of religion and the basic religious disposition in humans, and those uh, uh, who are closer to what I've been arguing for, uh, and namely who, who see that as a very striking, important uh, 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 side effect, a uh, uh, major side effect, of the human cognitive system and, and, and the way human li live with one another. So I've been trying to, to uh, d develop an understanding more generally of culture and more specifically of, of, of religion uh, along those lines, which takes two, two sides. On the one hand, there is the uh, attempt to I mean, understanding, the kind of understanding that, that I wished for under the influence of my father uh, takes two forms. There's a kind of interpretive understanding, putting yourself in other people's shoes or mine, more precisely, trying to see things from their point of view, and that's been part of my work. I've done that as, an, as a fieldwork anthropologist studying the Dose of southern Ethiopia. And there's another kind of explanation, which is kind of a causal explanation, trying to explain why things are the way they are, and so in particular why humans have the uh, uh, cultures they do, in particular the religions they do, in a causal manner. And it is this aspect of my work which will be at the focus of, 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 of these lectures. Uh, uh, so, so many questions uh, c can be and are being asked uh, uh, about religion. I won't spend much time identifying what I believe are wrong questions, questions which are not uh, really fruitful. Again, in this uh, perspective in which I'm situating myself, which is a kind of descriptive and explanatory perspective. Of course, if you're religious yourself, uh, uh, what is religion, or if you just think about your own personal experience, uh, what is religion is maybe a very sound and important question. For if you're a social scientist, as I am, uh, um, I think it's not. And I think it's not for, 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 for the following reason. Uh, uh, let me uh, uh, illustrate. So, so for instance, I was on, actually on the plane coming to Nashville, uh, from Paris, it's a, from London, it's a, it's a long trip. So I reread this splendid book of uh, Frederick Barth, uh, he's, he's a Norwegian uh, anthropologist, he's one of the two guys here. And the, so you guess, if you can tell, you know, one, one of them is a native, a Bakhtaman. So the Bakhtaman are a group, uh, when, were a group when uh, uh, Barth uh, visited them in uh, 1968, they were 183 people living in the mountains inside New Guinea. Um, from the, the mountain region which we live, we could see uh, other mountain regions beyond and, and villages and the fire coming, but they never, uh, they, they could see places where none of them had ever been. They hardly moved more than, say, 30 miles away from where they were all born, lived, and died. And, and so the known world stopped. You could see beyond, you know, you could see things with a, a world with people. You knew there were living beings there but you never just uh, ever went that far uh, until just a few years before Bart went there, it would have been too dangerous anyhow uh, before the pacification. Uh, uh, 
so, so, so that's the space uh, dimension, the time dimension. So imagine just what it means culturally or how you develop your sense of who you are, how you fit in the world, if that's the kind of space in which you live. The, 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 the time uh, dimension is even more interesting. There are people who don't count beyond 27. In practice, they hardly ever count beyond 10. Uh, um, but they don't have a system to con count beyond 27. And, and in terms of time, so they, 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 they have a notion of a day, and they have a notion of a moon, of a, uh, uh, sorry, a moon, uh, a moon cycle. They don't know how many days there are in a moon cycle. Uh, they, they look back, they can see, like two moons uh, back, like two months back, and two months forward. That's about how far they, they, they will situate things in time in the uh, past or in the future. So everything that has in the past beyond that is uh, including in their own lives is in this indefinite past, and that's it. So think again of, of uh, 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 what it means as compared to our sense of history, our, our sense of being situated in time and space, in particular in a religious context, where, where of course the narrative uh, extends thousands of years before, uh, uh, and it's important for, for people who are participating in, in, in the, the, the great religion, are Christians, Jews, uh, Muslims, and so on. This historical cognition, both in time and space, is one of the defining fact, factors uh, of uh, um, religious belonging. So all that is not even available, couldn't, couldn't be available to the Bhakta man. So when, when Frederick Barth studying them, uh, and he studied ritual, what anthropologist comes out of the heading of religion, well, they are kind of initiation, they had no gods, no divinity, nothing of the sort. Uh, they had uh, uh, spirits, ancestor spirits, uh, forest spirits, things like that. They had c complex rituals uh, um, of initiation, going through seven grades, for which they all w went through, with specialists like, like this man, kind of organizing, kind of priest or whatever, organizing, and temples, I mean, houses dedicated to these rituals. Uh, um, but, but uh, and taboos and uh, uh, a variety of uh, rituals where again uh, nothing like divinity where the role of the spirit was rather limited and so on. So religion, yes, uh, in the sense for anthropologists we have no problem calling that religion. Uh, but it looks very, very, very different from the great religions that uh, most of you are, 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 are all of you are f f familiar with. Uh, uh, so, so when we, as anthropologists, we would think uh, since uh, uh, some of the f uh, major people in our field, like Edmund Leach, for instance, argued, we would think, uh, uh, or Rodney Needham, that we, it, there is no sense in looking for a definition of what is religion. It's a family resemblance notion. Uh, we, we, it's a way of waving at certain uh, things which go together and which uh, call for similar competencies and uh, when you study them, uh, raise similar questions, but there is no essence of uh, uh, what the topic would be. And that's true not just for religion, but it's true for uh, the economy, for the market, for warfare, for kinship and so on. So the notion that there are certain well-defined type of social phenomena has been very much put into question uh, in, in, in anthropology. And so, of course, we can see commonalities between the religion of the Bhaktaman and, 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 and the, we'll say, Western religions, but not more than commonalities. Or to take example from my own fieldwork among the Doze of Southern Ethiopia, that the man Keso Alate is about to sacrifice this uh, 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 lamb in, in, in front of him. But there, you would say, oh, no, here we find religion a more natural, a more so natural, sorry, a more common form in the sense that if you ask the Dose uh, about the religion, they would say they're Christians. And they would say uh, Christian belonging to the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And they are. Uh, uh, they, they, they are in, in the territory, there are two uh, churches in the physical sense, uh, and they participate in, in, in the rites uh, of the uh, uh, Ethiopian Orthodox Church. At the same time, they also have ancestors' uh, worship, uh, they make sacrifices, this is for, in this case for ancestors, also for uh, spirit in the forest and so on. They have spirit possession, they have a complex system of taboos. So to the anthropologists, the religion, uh, uh, of a dose includes uh, 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 Christian rituals and, and, and beliefs and so many other things. And that's a fairly typical situation that you find in many parts of the world or you found you say, in classical antiquity when you had many different cults. And here Christianity is one cult among many. And people may be more interested in one cult or, or in another and so on. Again, uh, no, no problem if we think of religion as an area of human experience and of uh, an aspect of social things uh, which we're likely to find forms of in every place we go to. Uh, but, uh, but 
very much going against the notion of looking for a general uh, uh, de definition uh, of a phenomena. And so the idea that, that, that uh, we have a number of concepts which are helpful as first pass to identify types of problems, areas of social life, uh, but that do, are not the proper object of definition of uh, distinct theories and so on, I think is, is, is a proper one uh, in, in the field of anthropology, uh, as it is in, in, in many others. And it's linked to, to, to uh, uh, an important uh, um, distinction that's been uh, in ways of approaching a phenomena uh, which uh, uh, has been clearly expressed in the domain of biology uh, by the uh, biologist and theoretician and historian of biology, Ernst Meyer. So he contrasted typological thinking versus population thinking. Uh, so his typological thinking, he wrote, no doubt has its root in earliest, the earliest effort of primitive men to classify the bewildering diversity of nature into categories. The eidos of Plato is the formal philosophical codification of this form of thinking. According to it, there are a limited number of fixed, unchangeable ideas underlying the observability with the eidos idea being the only thing that is fixed and real while the observability has no more reality, reality than the shadows of an object of a cave wall. W w uh, cave wall. You don't have to be a Platonist about it. You don't have to, 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 to buy the Platonist as aspect of it. The notion that there are essences uh, 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 in instantiated in, in, in all the kind of things we find and study in the world is a powerful one, and I don't know if it uh, has to do uh, with primitive man, but it's certainly a very strong disposition in all of us, in fact, to, to, to think, of, you know, to what category does something belong and to take this work of t t typology of categorization to be aimed at uh, 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 an essence that, would, that characterize things sharing the same category. And, and Maya was contrasting that with another way of thinking that, that uh, uh, um, for him, it's, it's strongly linked to Darwin, but has its origins also. I mean, it's true that Darwin was probably the, 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 the most important influence, but it has origin also in, in the development of economics in, in the 18th century, uh, uh, and what he called population thinking. So the assumptions of population thinking are diametrically opposed to those of a typologist. The populationist stresses the uniqueness of everything in the organic world, and I would say in the social world. Uh, what is true for the human species, that no two individuals are alike, is equally true for all other species of animals and plants. Averages are merely statistical abstractions, only the individuals of which the population are composed have reality. Uh, uh, so, 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 uh, so, so what you get basically in, in the biological work uh, are, are, are distributions of traits or features, uh, uh, or if you go to the gene level, uh, 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 frequencies of genes in, 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 in the gene pool, which vary over time, uh, uh, and, uh, and you don't get, for instance, uh, living species having essences, so the kind of essentialism that uh, uh, Norbert Ross has studied actually in the field and, and, and uh, that we know well that, uh, with which we tend to approach uh, uh, animals and plants doesn't make biological sense. Now, the issue, so as I said, I think if when we're dealing with the social world, uh, a populationist thinking uh, is appropriate. It's a source of major insight. By the way, I mean, I'm defending, trying to develop a certain approach to culture in general, so social phenomena, religion in particular. I'm not doing that in an exclusive manner. I'm not saying you have to go this way. That's the only uh, source of insight of way of doing things. I've, I hope that what I'm trying to do is a source of insight, is worth developing. I'm, I've no doubt I mean, uh, uh, that other approaches are also uh, 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 of, of major relevance to, to understanding these phenomena. So the issue is what are the individuals uh, or, or, or of what are made the populations that are relevant uh, to the social domain. You might think people. I don't think it's correct. I mean, there's all, I don't think that, that, that uh, the, the uh, 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 religion or culture or for that matter, a society is properly described as being made of individuals uh, in sense of individual uh, uh, people, uh, uh, individual organisms. Uh, uh, but let me first read this conclusion from uh, 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 Mayer of the same passage. The, the ultimate conclusions of the population thinker and the typologist are precisely the opposite. For the typologist, the types 
and the type is real and the variation an illusion, while for the population is the type or the average is an abstraction, only the variation is real, the distribution if you prefer. No two ways of looking at nature could be more different. So in the, in the uh, uh, case of the social phenomena, if we want to apply population thinking to the study of society and culture, uh, there are many ways of doing it. So you, you might indeed take the uh, individual people uh, as the, uh, defining the population uh, um, of relevance, which is what people who, uh, in, in the social sciences who are called methodological individualists uh, have, have, have been doing with a certain amount of success, but I think there are limits to it. I want to suggest that we go further to, to a more uh, um, micro level than just taking people. Uh, what's of interest, if you study culture in particular, are population of events and traces of events. And events, I'm, by events I mean micro-events, small things. Right? So like somebody talking to somebody else, the words uh, of the events in which we are involved now. But now there's not just one event taking place. There's one event of my talking to you. But there are events taking place in my mind and each one of your minds. Uh, 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 so there are many events taking place in this room simultaneously which are all uh, 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 relevant, I think, to an, an understanding of this particular cultural phenomenon that is a lecture, that is a lecture, this particular lecture. Uh, if, it were, if you just describe the, the, the uh, uh, person speaking, uh, uh, you would, that doesn't give you a, a, a handle on, on the cultural impact that this may have. To under, uh, understand that, you have to go look at, see what's happening in the mind of the audience. So you have these public events and these mental events, and in general, I think uh, 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 social life and culture is made of an uh, alternation of public and mental events, uh, which are linked uh, uh, to one another uh, in, in some kind of causal chain. So this is a kind of a model of a causal chain in general, of events being linked with one another, and it's not just one event, uh, one, typically every event has many uh, events which uh, together constitute its causes, its cause, and, and may have causal effects which affects many, many other kinds of events. We just represent those we, we, we care about. And if we move to a, so the notion of causal chains, of course, is much more general, not specific to, to the social sciences. In fact, it's underdeveloped in the social sciences. But in the social domain, as I was suggesting, what is striking is that the uh, events that take place uh, are of two kinds, quite systematically. There are public events, and by public I mean events taking place in the shared environment of people, uh, outside of the body, uh, outside of the body and mind of individuals, but typically linking uh, the, the, the body and minds of, of uh, uh, different people. Uh, uh, but, so I will include as public, if, somebody whisp if, if one of you is whispering something to uh, the, your neighbor, uh, uh, that's a public event in, in, in the sense in which I mean it. And mental event, I, I mean, you know, having thoughts, having ideas, uh, having intentions, having desires, and so on, forming these. Uh, uh, and the, 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 the way public and mental events are, are, are linked is because uh, the result of our mental state, one of the effects of our mental state is to guide our behavior, and our behavior is perceptible by others or leave traces which are perceptible by others uh, 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 in a way which can, may cause them to form mental uh, uh, representations, uh, which in turn may contribute to the way they will act and behave in the, in, 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 in the future. Uh, uh, so so I, the, the uh, 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 social life is made of uh, 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 these causal chains with huge populations of, of, of these micro events. Uh, which are causally linked uh, uh, to, to, to one another. Or at least we can look at it that way and see if it leads us somewhere interesting. Um, and a particular way I think it, it becomes interesting is if one is interested, which you may not be, but I am, uh, uh, in indeed uh, get unifying the sciences, getting an integrated understanding of the world, uh, um, and linking in a fruitful manner uh, the social and so psychological sciences to the natural sciences. Um, and, and, and in this respect, uh, um, things have been happening, which I see as a really major development uh, in the past uh, uh, 30, 40 years, which have changed the situation quite radically. I mean, if you ask me what's been the most important 
uh, development in the social sciences or the human sciences in the past 50 years or so. I would certainly not name postmodernism or uh, not, not even game theory, which is quite important, uh, 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 or rational. So I would say the cognitive revolution without any hesitation. What's been happening is there's been a major development in the way we approach mental phenomena and uh, uh, seen as now being a variety of uh, information processing that can also be achieved uh, uh, by, 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 by machines. Uh, uh, and, and so uh, what is developing there uh, is we understand better and better how matter can think. And the matter that matters to us is the matter inside our brain, the, 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 uh, the, the brain tissues. Uh, uh, but in general, it's based on understanding how, how matter can process information. So while until the cognitive revolution, uh, uh, the fact that human life uh, uh, has uh, uh, a mental dimension everywhere you look, so you cannot study human beings forgetting that they're having mental states, thoughts, intentions, desires, fears, and so on. Uh, uh, this fact was keeping uh, the social sciences, the human sciences, apart from the natural sciences because this mental activity, the thought activity, was something of which we had no naturalistic understanding. We didn't know how it fit in nature. We could, one might decide, uh, think a priori is achieved by the brain, but how uh, a brain, how any uh, bunch of, you know, uh, of matter could, could uh, do any form of information processing, any form of thinking was something one had no idea of. And, that, uh, and now we do in better and better ways. I don't have the time to, to, to discuss in greater detail. So one way to describe the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the cognitive revolution, which is more than doing just better psychology and using computers to model it and so on, is in, what, in terms of what I'm calling here uh, cognitive causal chains or CCCs. Uh, uh, these are causal chains where the causal links establish content relationship. When thinking is about content and, co content and content relationship. So for instance, you see something and there's a relationship between some representation you have in your head and uh, the outside uh, stimulus, uh, the situation in front of you that, 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 that you see. Uh, you you, you, you uh, remember something and that's a relationship of content between a thought that you had and the thought you, you're having now. Content relationship. But these content relationships um, are formal relationships, they're abstract relationships, they're not in themselves causal relationships. And what the cognitive evolution does is explain what mechanism establish systematic causal relationship uh, among state of affairs, among events which uh, realize this abstract content relationship. Let me illustrate. So if you think of perception, uh, you have some, some stimulus uh, 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 which causes, uh, so for instance, you see, you're, you're now you're seeing me, so light is reflected from my body, if, uh, uh, comes to your retina, is being analyzed in the visual area of your brain and so on. So there's a causal process. And I, my, my very presence uh, here is a part of the cause of this uh, causal process. And if this causal process works well, uh, the result is, in your mind, a representation of me, which is true of me. Uh, uh, which you know, has this uh, content, you know, realizes this content relationship of being true of what you, so veridical perception uh, uh, is perception which, and it's a function of perception in general to be veridical, uh, uh, is a causal process that brings about a formal uh, relationship, formal content relationship. Or if you have an intention, and that guides your behavior through controlling your, your muscular movement through motor control, uh, it will bring about a state of affair. And if things go well, if the, the, the process of motor control fulfills its function, this state of affair will satisfy uh, your intention, that it, it will realize the content of your intention. So for instance, if I intend to pick my watch, I do this, and uh, uh, what I've just done satisfied my intention. Satisfaction is not a causal relationship, it's a content relationship, it's a formal relationship, but motor con action, the, the, the psychomotor mechanism of action, have, has, has the function to uh, realize uh, this function. Again, what, what's been happening with the cognitive revolution, we understand better and better the very mechanism at the material level of perception, of motor control, of inference. So you start in this case with, for instance, say two beliefs, two, two mental representations, uh, um, 
and you they play a causal role in, in deriving a further belief, which, if the inference is well done, is warranted by the, 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 the input belief, so you, the, 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 uh, which stand to the conclusion, uh, to, to the new belief, like premises stand to a conclusion. Being warranted by, again, is an abstract relationship, but the inference is a causal process. Uh, or remembering, again, I, I mentioned it before, you formed the belief a while back, uh, 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 now you, you remember uh, of information, uh, what, you, what you, 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 you knew then, and, and your current belief, which is updated in its formulation and so on, resemble, if remembering uh, works well, in relevant respect, the belief you had initially formed. Well, these things can, can, can uh, uh, typically uh, uh, c combine in complex causal chains. Uh, 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 f for instance, uh, you, may, the, the, you, you woke out in the morning, the street is wet, uh, 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 but you haven't, you don't know why it's wet, but you just see that the street is wet, so you, you form the belief through perception that it is. You remember uh, that every first Monday of the week they, they wash the street in front of you. It's not raining, it's, it's signing. You draw an inference from the belief that it's wet because it's been washed before you, you went out, and that belief is true of an event that you didn't see. Again, this complex uh, causal chain, uh, cognitive causal chain, CCC, uh, realizes uh, 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 um, uh, uh, realizes a uh, 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 content relationship. Now, what psychologists do, cognitive psychologists, typically they, they study only one type of link in this cognitive causal chain. Some are specialized in perception, some in memory, some in mo motor control, some in inference. They don't even bother to, to put in a chain this thing, uh, these processes at this uh, s simple level. So basically, but more generally speaking, psychologists are looking at processes that either take place uh, inside the individual or at the interface of the individual and its environment. But what I want to suggest to you is that if we define a causal cognitive, uh, uh, a causal cognitive uh, uh, chain by the fact that it's a causal process that has the function of realizing some content relationship, it's not limited to individual psychology. It's not limited to a uh, process that occur just in, in ourselves. It occurs also across individuals uh, in, in, in a social manner. Uh, uh, so I want to, def to, to, to suggest that cognitive causal chains establishing, do establish content relationship across individuals uh, through changes in their common environment. And these CCCs, that go beyond the individual, that link individual among themselves. I want to call them social CCCs. So very simple example, if just the very process of communication meets my definition perfectly because it starts from some speaker, now I'm going to name them by the color blue as some communicative intention, which she realizes by bringing about some change in the environment, namely by sound, uh, a sound pattern by, by uttering a, a, a sentence which yellow uh, perceives and then interprets and if things go well the interpretation resembles, resembles in, or is, you know, in, in content the content of the communicative intention of a speaker. So you get exactly, it falls directly against the, the definition of a cognitive causal chain but it's about relationship among people. And the same thing goes if you think a slightly, just slightly more complex testimony. Yellow has been witness to some a state of affairs, some event. Uh, uh, and she reports it to Green uh, by producing a testimony which will make Green uh, uh, knowledgeable about the state of affair that she, uh, she herself had not uh, been, able to, uh, been able to observe. Uh, or if you take a, a request uh, going in the other direction, uh, Pink has a, a, a desire uh, that he is not in, 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 uh, able to fulfill directly, but for this he recruits uh, 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 Blue uh, by expressing a request, uh, 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 and Blue complies and brings about a state of affair that satisfies Pink's desire. We do that all the time, uh, and this is a cognitive uh, a causal chain. Uh, it's, 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 about, it's a reliable way to bring about, uh, 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 to realize uh, uh, content relationships between state of affair in the world and mental states, uh, uh, but which involves uh, several people. Uh, um, the, these cognitive so this social uh, uh, cognitive causal chain, I should have put social here on, on the, on, on the uh, overhead, uh, um, form a mesh. That is, no social event belongs to only one uh, uh, social CCC. They always belong to several simultaneously. Why? Uh, because in order to achieve uh, uh, 
our interactions, we make use of a number of cultural uh, tools uh, 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 which themselves are available to us through much longer uh, causal chain. So when I speak to you, or when you say, or, or if you, let's take a more uh, trivial event, uh, uh, um, if you ask uh, uh, your, the person you're sitting with, please pass the salt, uh, um, uh, or if you ring somebody's bell in order to get the door open, uh, th these very local kind of events, uh, uh, which are social CCCs, they are com communication, they are requests, uh, uh, are made possible uh, by the use of, say, language, words. But the, each time you use a word, this word exists because of a, a, a causal chain that extends over centuries and then involves millions of speakers who've made this word have this reliable, like, sold, pass the sold, each of these words. You can use it in a local interaction uh, because it belongs also to a very long, ongoing causal chain that makes this uh, 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 an element of coordination among uh, people in the same linguistic community. So each time you use a word, you also contribute to the maintenance of that word in your language. Uh, words are maintained in the language only by our use of them. Uh, uh, so it's a, you might say my contribution when I say pass the salt to maintaining the word salt in English is very limited. Yes, but there is no, no, that's the kind of contribution that makes the world remain in the language. If you ring the bell and get somebody to understand that you want the door open, you can do that because there, there is a long uh, extended social cognitive causal chain that uh, makes b uh, bells uh, a, a type of element that serves precisely to, to communicate uh, content, requests for uh, the door being open. And every time you do so, you contribute to the availability of, of doorbells as means of interacting with one another. So every of our local, uh, small, short, uh, social co uh, cognitive causal chain, our local interaction uh, is also, every uh, link in it is also, uh, be belongs to a much longer uh, 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 a causal chain where the, the, the tools we use, the cultural tools we use, uh, are, are, are being transmitted over a much longer time. So social CCCs, they typically crisscross one another. And in particular, many links in short or local social CCCs, in local interactions if you want, typically also belong to long spread out CCCs that stabilize uh, the, the tools we use for our interactions. So I want to define a special kind of CCC, uh, social CCC, a special size type of social cognitive causal chain, namely cultural cognitive causal chain, CCCC. Or it's, it's just four times C, it's easy. You can practice. I have, now I can do it. Uh, so, cultural cognitive causal chain, or, or, or cultural CC chains, or call it the way you want, uh, are uh, what stabilizes uh, uh, content in the culture. So when you use the word salt, you do so because there is a, this long, long chain, again a chain with many, uh, you know, thousands or millions of branches, uh, 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 which uh, is made of all the events of the world being, uh, salt being used with its meaning and ma making uh, and, and spreading the knowledge of both the, the, the sound and meaning of the word salt so that it can be used again <coughs> and, and again. Uh, uh, and in general, I want to make, not here because I don't have time to argue for it, but uh, uh, the, the general argument that whatever is cultural is cultural in virtue of it having its properties being explained by its being embedded in a, a cultural cognitive causal chain. And everything that is embedded in such a chain is cultural to that extent. So, so, so by what, to, to, for something to be cultural, to be part of a, a people's culture, is uh, to be uh, 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 some uh, idea, practice, artifact uh, 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 that is uh, uh, being spread, uh, distributed, maintained, stabilized uh, through these long uh, CCCCs. So let me just give uh, 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 an example. So this is, take the example of folk tales. So this is uh, Little Red Riding Hood in an illustration of Gustave Doré. Um, and what is a folk tale? Well, you might think of it in a 
typological manner, as many people have done. So you might distinguish, so you know, one, in, you might think of Little Red Riding Hood as being something that has its own identity in a strong manner, its essence, if you want, that contrasts to that of other folk tales. And you might think of folk tales in general. So, so, so it would be one of the instances of a category for, for a folk tale. And the folk tale would be something, uh, again, uh, well defined. And you might, might ask, you know, what's the difference between a folk tale and a legend, expecting that there should be some fundamental answer to such a kind of question. Uh, um, and you would see Little Red Riding Hood as being where and when, so to speak. Well, you might say, oh, yes, it's, it's, a, it's, it's in Europe. It has, been, it has existed in, Euro, in Europe mostly uh, for, for, for a number of centuries from the Middle Ages onwards, and then it has spread to the rest of the world and so on. But, but, uh, but still, it's uh, as if Little Red Riding Hood was hovering above, you know, or above European societies in this time dimension. Where is it located? Uh, can you touch it? Can you, can you visualize it? Can you hear it? Well, you can hear it, of course, but not one time, again and again and again, millions of times. It's there because it's been told millions of times. And it's been told all millions of times because another case, so there's been all these events of a telling of Little Red Riding Hood. Uh, uh, and they could occur only because there were the mental events of the people hearing it and remembering it and being th thereby made able to uh, tell it in their turn. So, so if we, we can take a fragment of it, so, so basically a folk tale is distributed uh, uh, by a very extended causal chain uh, where you have an alternation of public and mental events, uh, public events of telling, of a narrative, mental event of, uh, uh, of uh, forming, remembering the story, extracting from, not because you don't remember the words uh, of, of, of a tale, what you remember is the, of the content, you extract the story from, from it. And this above is a fragment of the causal chain of, say, Little Red Riding Hood or any other folk tale. So, so the same of the tale is being told, so we have different narratives. So they're not really identical because nobody tells the tale in exactly the same word in the same manner it was told. So they're all a bit different, but they're nevertheless uh, uh, not that different that they, 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 this difference would be much perceived. And people, on the basis of having heard several times narratives of Little Red Riding Hood, form remember uh, the story and may turn the, themselves into tellers of, of a tale. And so the tale may uh, end up being distributed like that. And you might want to zoom out. One thing you could do, you could zoom out from this fragment and indeed move out, to, uh, zoom out to uh, the historical dimension of uh, how did uh, the tale fare uh, change itself, mod get modified, spread uh, uh, over the centuries. Uh, in, in, in Europe, or you might want to zoom in, which you could also do. So you might look at what's happening in the head of Blue here, and Blue heard the tale from uh, 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 green and, and pink, uh, um, and you could go inside. You could zoom in, and that is go inside Blue's head, and, and you'd see that, that uh, she'd heard the tale twice, but probably wasn't aware that there were different. She, she synthesizes it in a single mental story, which she remembered. And in some circumstances, she's motivated to recall it. Then she goes through a fairly complex process of reformulating it and produce a new telling uh, for the benefit of new listeners. And of course, if you were, if, or if you are a cognitive psychologist, each of these phenomena, like uh, you know, comprehension, uh, synthesis of various versions, uh, remembering it, recalling, being motivated, are quite complex uh, cognitive processes. So you could zoom in even much in, in, to, to, to much greater and greater detail. Which, by the way, uh, it, the suggestion here is this. Uh, um, it's, it's a point of philosophy of science, if you want. It, it's, uh, uh, the issue uh, it's, this is uh, addressing is the following. What is the relationship uh, between what we describe as social scientists uh, or what we describe as psychologists. What's the relationship between a, 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 a folk tale or a religious belief or a, 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 a practice or an ideology seen as a social phenomenon and the same thing seen uh, uh, as a part of a person's uh, mental processes, experience maybe if it's at a personal level or sub-personal uh, me mental processes. Uh, and the, the answer that is uh, quite uh, dominant is that these are kind of two levels of reality. I mean, you're looking at things at two different levels. 
uh, uh, two different levels in the same manner, manner in, in which, for instance, if you compare the relationship between neurology uh, uh, and, and psychology, these are two, uh, you, of course, if you describe neurological process, you're also, in a sense, talking about the same thing that if you're describing a psychological process, but the, the idiom is completely different. In one case, you're describing neurons, the other, you're describing thoughts, memories, uh, uh, inferences, and so on. And you could zoom, you know, you could be focused on, on a single neuron, and you could zoom out and out, and you would, or, or at every level, you, what you would be seeing would be neurons. And it's a discovery to understand that these neurons are performing this particular psychological task. But the two descriptions, the neurological one and the psychological one, today, uh, are not being reduced to one another. There are two different levels. It's precisely because there are two different levels the issue of a reduction com comes up, otherwise you don't have an issue of, of, of reduction. And, and, and so that's one type of relationship you can get between disciplines. If you think of a relationship now between epidemiology uh, 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 and individual pathology, it's quite different. You may be looking at an individual case of, say, uh, the common cold. Uh, uh, so you're looking at the process inside the organism and what's happening. And if you zoom out and move from the individual to, a, so you, you might zoom in and go to the level of the cells that are being uh, affected by, 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 by the virus, and so on, or you can zoom out to the individual's environment where there are other people uh, and look at the interaction. And then you would come to a point where you'd see the epidemiological phenomena, the epidemics of, uh, this, of the flu or the cold or whatever. And, and so by changing, so, so, so in this case, it's not a difference of levels between epidemiology and pathology, it's a difference of scale. You're looking at the same thing, but by changing the scale, what you see is, is, is different, different questions can be asked, but you can, again, you have the ability to move in and out and you're always looking at the same thing. So the, the dominant view regarding the relationship between the social and the individual and the psychological has been that it's a difference of level. Uh, and I'm arguing for the view that it's a difference of scale. So, 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 so that contrary to, to what many people have uh, uh, argued, uh, 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 that is contrary to the view uh, uh, that the psychological description of uh, people's beliefs uh, uh, the narratives they know and so on, is not relevant to the social sciences. Uh, I'm arguing on the contrary, that there's a relationship of mutual relevance between the social and the individual in the same way as there's an rela obvious relationship of mutual relevance between the epidemiological and the patho and, and individual pathology. So, so we, you, we, you can move uh, in and out. Uh, zoom in and out in, 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 in the case of folktale, and in the, the coming two further lectures, I will illustrate that with religious phenomena. Uh, here's a, just to, the, the case of a folktale is extremely simple because basically what you get are mental and public representation of the same thing. So the, the, you know you re, you, the image you have of a tale in your mind, and then the public telling of it, and these alternate. If you take a slightly more complex uh, cultural phenomena like the uh, 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 apple pie. The apple pie, illustrated here, is you might want to say, oh, you know, how does the apple pie spread? Well, there are the people who have the, the know-how how to make an apple pie, so that's in their head. Then they demonstrate how to make it, and somebody else has learned, just as with the folklore. But you would never get the apple pie being part of a culture if it were not for the existence of actual apple pie and people who eat them. Uh, and, uh, and you know, ask for apple pie, uh, and get the apple, get the, the people who know how to cook them to cook them, uh, get some pleasure for it, uh, so that they desire it again, ask again the, the former cook or the new cook, and so on. So you know, already with an apple pie, the, the causal chain has a certain degree of complexity. It involves several, uh, uh, both uh, uh, mental and public things, being causally linked. Uh, and, and spreading together. If you just have the spread of the know-how without the spread of the desire and the spread of the actual apple pie, it would not uh, uh, become uh, stabilized uh, in, in any culture. So if we look in this epidemiological perspective at religious phenomena, um, well, first, again, what we, we will do is take this population thinking approach. So we're not asking again, in this perspective, and I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that in our perspective a question would be useless. In this social science descriptive perspective, we're not asking what is religion. It's, it, it's typically the kind of question we don't want to ask. We're asking you know, what type of distribution of phenomena 
uh, do, do we find that are linked together what uh, 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 cultural cognitive causal chain uh, do uh, 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 distribute in a population uh, various types of beliefs, practices, and so on, which in some sense are linked to one another uh, around themes, aspects which we identify uh, as religious. Uh, uh, so religious beliefs, they are beliefs with kind of specific content, and it's not, it doesn't have to be uh, we could, we'd be quite happy if there are lots of cases which are uh, you know, borderline cases. It's not clear they're religious, not religious, magical beliefs, whatever. You do it really fall under the definition of religious or not? It doesn't matter. But there are beliefs with certain specific contents uh, 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 which are stabilized by uh, CCCCs. Uh, same thing with religious artifacts. There are artifacts which have specific functions and they are stabilized by these causal chains, cultural causal chains. Same thing with rituals. The rituals are uh, they're not just simple events, uni uh, atomic events uh, on uh, cultural cognitive causal chains because they themselves they typically involve a succession of events, both mental and public. So there are patterns of events. Uh, 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 there are patterns uh, of, uh, that constitute social uh, cognitive causal chains, and these patterns themselves are stabilized by cultural uh, uh, causal chains. Uh, and about religious institutions, uh, which I also want to, to approach in this uh, uh, epidemiological perspective, uh, I will say more because I have not introduced uh, the basic notions uh, in, the, in the further lecture. So to conclude today's lecture, uh, I've suggested that we met with three explanatory tasks, again in this perspective. One is explaining uh, the diversity uh, of, of, of uh, re religious phenomena. And it's, in, in general, if you think of uh, anthropology, of this, uh, it's explaining cultural diversity in general. And the diversity of religion has always been, uh, been taken uh, uh, as a, a central goal, or even the central goal, at the theoretical level uh, of, 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 of anthropology. And of course it applies to, 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 to religious phenomena, which as I illustrated before, uh, take on such uh, so uh, many quite different uh, uh, forms uh, uh, across society and culture. But, but, but the, the way uh, you, you, we were going to approach that in an epidemiological uh, perspective, uh, is look at the difference of distributions uh, 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 is try to explain the, the diversity in, in terms of the changes uh, that occur over time in the di distribution uh, of these religious beliefs, practices and artifacts and so on. So just as uh, so, so the changes come from divergences, from, 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 from uh, 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 splits uh, and sometimes mergings, uh, in, in various uh, 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 tradition, uh, and these phenomena uh, we want to look at uh, in terms of the micro uh, processes that bring them about, rather than just uh, only zooming out at the most uh, largest historical level when they are typically discussed. I mean, the, histor the, the macro historical level finds its explanation, its causal explanation, in the micro processes. Uh, that bring, bring it about. But to explain the diversity of cultural phenomena in general, uh, um, one has to explain indeed, uh, study how uh, in the process of transmission along uh, the uh, cultural causal chains, uh, 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 what happens is something quite different than mere replication. There are, uh, there's variation, there's variation all the time. Without the, the, the micro variation, you would not get the macro variation that you observe. Uh, at, at an historical scale. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the, the, so the task of explaining cultural diversity and religious diversity in particular has always been the obvious task for anthropologists and historians of religion uh, and culture. But there's another thing that calls for an explanation and the explanation is by no means simple and obvious. In fact, I think it's a challenge on the same magnitude as explaining uh, uh, of diversity, and that's explaining stability. Because after, or to put it in other terms, what is striking is the very existence of these long 
cultural cognitive causal chains. Why isn't, aren't we a species with only local interaction, with only social uh, 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 cognitive causal chains? If you think of other animal species which have of a social, uh, social species, like other primates, or some species of birds or, or insects and so on. So they're involved in interactions uh, all, all the time, which are social interactions just as I described them. They have the cognitive dimension that's present all the time. But these interactions don't stabilize uh, 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 cultural traditions, uh, or if they do, as they do, for instance, some chimpanzees, some crows, and so on, it's of a very limited content, just a few techniques maybe. Uh, stabilized in, in an animal population, whereas we uh, stabilize, human beings stabilize uh, uh, millions, literally millions uh, uh, of artifact practices, ideas, and so on among them. So how do we do that? How come that in the process of transmission, uh, the information doesn't get transformed or destroyed? How come that entropy doesn't win? all the time. It wins a lot of the time. A lot of our information we transmit gets, get lo gets, lost, gets lost just like water falling on the sand. But some of it somehow is resilient. And it's not that it gets copied if you look at the micro processes of transmission. It's not that it gets copied like a Xerox machine along the way. There's a lot of the micro invent of, of transmission uh, uh, and if we have time, we'll just talk about that a bit more next time, involve a lot of variation, uh, which together should, again, bring about just uh, an effect of noise. But somehow, these micro variation, which occur all the time, cancel in one another. Uh, uh, and in spite of them, you find this relative stability, in particular, of religious phenomena. And that calls for an explanation. It's not obvious at all. Uh, of how this is possible at all. It's, it's a kind of unique uh, human achievement to stabilize uh, cultural phenomena in the way we do, and religious phenomena in particular. And understanding the mechanism of it uh, is quite crucial. And of course, the two uh, questions of explaining the diversity and explaining the stability do go together. If it were not for the stability, we would not recognize anything as cultural. Uh, the stability is relative, but it's sufficient for us to recognize the same folk tale, the same, even if the versions are not, not identical, the same uh, uh, faith, even if e each individual uh, has a different experience in this respect, the same ritual, even if it's not performed exactly <coughs> as it was last time and so on. And th that calls for explanation. And of course, there is the question I mean, we start uh, uh, as social actors and uh, more specifically for some of us as social scientists, with, with, with a sense uh, uh, that a, a number of phenomena uh, go together, share something. Uh, uh, so, so there is some property uh, of some of these uh, cultural phenomena that make them uh, religious uh, phenomena. So when I denied that there, it was a good question to ask what is religion uh, 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 from uh, the social science point of view, uh, uh, I'm not denying, so, or you know, I denied that there was a substantive, uh, an, an, a, a noun that referred to a kind of a, a proper distinct object. On the other hand, I find the use of religious as an adjective, uh, as a property that uh, social phenomena exhibit to a greater or lesser extent, uh, uh, quite uh, sen sensible. I would extend that to culture. I don't think there are cultures. I think things are more or less, on the other hand, they have a property of being cultural is an important one uh, in, in human uh, interaction and affairs. So things are more or less cultural. And among the things which are more or less cultural, some are more or less religious. And it's interesting to, 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 to try and find out what. So we will be talking about th giving fragments of, of a sketchy answer uh, to this question in the two uh, other lectures of this series. Thank you. And then uh, we'll sure. Yes, okay. uh, feel free to ask questions for 8, 10, 20 minutes, and we'll retire also that way. Some questions from the audience. Please. Thank you for coming. I enjoyed your lecture. The distinction between uh, psychology and sociological scale is interesting. I wanted to ask you just about that. Um, sometimes the constructs that we set up might lead to certain conclusions that the constructs themselves dictate. So I'm wondering what confidence in your approach do you have that the, the constructs you have aren't distorting the phenomena itself? 
and, and that when you collapse mm -hmm. things together that you get something that's coherent? <coughs> It's a, it's, a, it's a good question. The confidence is limited. Look, I think as scientists, what we try to do is develop tools, construct if you want in particular, uh, uh, that will uh, improve our understanding uh, of the world or those aspects of the world we study. There is no guarantee that uh, we are successful. There is a risk that you rightly point out uh, that in fact we make, uh, our construct may, may put in the phenomena properties that are not there, so we may introduce biases and so be, be not, not be a genuine source of light. Uh, so, so I'm, my, my, my trust comes from the fact that it's, uh, I'm being challenged all the time, and so I hope that when I'm making mistakes, there are people who jump on me and immediately point it out. Uh, uh, and uh, if, but there are people jumping on me all the time, but somehow I'm not on the ground yet. So I assume that, it's, 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 so basically I, I, uh, my reason to be uh, moderately optimistic about uh, uh, um, this particular enterprise and what we do more generally is, is the uh, acceptance that characterizes the scientific approach uh, of uh, the possibility that we might be totally on the wrong track and the fact that we are each, each other's throat uh, uh, um, uh, uh, to, to basically see how resistant uh, we are in, 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 in full of criticism. So that I don't have any stronger reason to be optimistic about it. Yes? I'm struck by a feature of your causal change mm. that you didn't mention, mm -hmm. but, I'm, but I'm sure it's mm -hmm. there. Yeah. The, the, if, you, if you think about what does the stabilization, mm. it's the loop back mm -hmm. to, the, to the first step in the chain. Uh, and in fact, this is something that's very well known from control theory mm -hmm. and, and yep. technology. And it seems to me that in fact, Okay, although you didn't show you didn't show such mm -hmm. reconnections in your analysis mm -hmm. of folk tales, mm -hmm. that this is critical because you can form causal links, but if if the person at the end of the chain is running open loop to use the control mm -hmm. theory jargon, in fact, that is not a stable. That's even though the chain may be very may be causal, if without the feedback loop to stabilize it. It, uh, then, then, you, uh, then entropy wins. Yeah, well, it's an excellent and very precise question, uh, uh, to, uh, which would deserve a longer answer than I have time to give. Uh, but, but, but the issue is, so what does the stabilization? So one way uh, is indeed to have a feedback loop that, that does it. So that's what you have seen Darwin with the Darwin selection. Uh, basically. So a number of uh, people, uh, many coming from biology, have assumed that you could approach uh, uh, cultural phenomena basically by ad adapting to, 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 to them the uh, um, uh, Darwinian model of selection. So, so and that takes a well-known view of mimetics defended by, by Richard Dawkins. So the idea then are bits of culture uh, are, are uh, replicators uh, uh, competing basically for space in, in both people's mind and social space. Uh, uh, and, and those which have the greatest reproductive success uh, are, are, are other winners and, and the element that compose a, 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 a culture. So this, those aspects, so each of them has many effects. Those effects which contribute to their own reproductive success in a feedback loop uh, explain their place in the culture. Now, I wish it were uh, simple, uh, true because it's a nice and simple story. Uh, uh, and I think if, if there's some truth in it, but I think it's, it's not uh, as good as it sounds. It's not as good as it sounds because of something I alluded to before, namely that if you look at the microprocess of transmission, they're not process of replication. I mean, I've been giving a lecture now for about an hour. Um, what is the chances of my ideas having been replicated in your mind as a result of this lecture? You know, I'd be very happy of, say, 5% of... So, so what, what I just said? Yes. yes. Uh, I said, I've been giving this lecture. What is the probability that now there's a copy of what I've said in your mind? <laughs> very low. So, if, say, you know, if it's been successful, my lecture, what it would mean that, say, 5% of what I've been said somehow has made its way into your mind has of course been distorted, has been mixed with your own ideas, but still you won't have wasted your time and I won't have wasted mine. That's uh, uh, you know, success in, in cultural transmission. Uh, uh, um, 
And in spite of, we, we, we get stability in spite of, of, of this. Of course, there are cases where the copy is better, but still, it's, there's a lot of. Uh, so, so, you may get other uh, of, uh, factors of stabilization uh, b b b besides, besides the, the, the feedback loop, or at least the selection is feedback loop. Exactly. Yeah, yes. But so what I've been suge suge suggesting is what what you have. I, if you look at the transition probabilities, the way in which things are get get distorted, they're not randomly distributed. If, if, if they tend in the direction of attractors in the space of possibilities, which themselves have to be explained. And, have, and so, I'm ready. So, so so you get a kind of. So, so there, but the question you ask is exactly the right, the right question. But I think it calls for a complex uh, uh, answer where feedback is not the only uh, uh, factor. Yes? Just to stay with that idea, no. you asked what was going through a person's mind mm. as we mm. heard what you mm. presented. Uh, it actually, you spoke about a hundred and uh, uh, maybe an hour and 40 minutes, and you never mentioned a woman. I did. Uh, okay, I, I, I missed it. Then. I don't hear well, no. but you didn't mention many. Almost every reference. Oh, the reference where, where and, yes. And mankind and so on. I'm just no, no, I, no I, I, I never say mankind. I say humankind. Okay. Uh, uh, that's, uh, whatever. And, and every time I talk about an anonymous person, uh, uh, she, it was a she. If, if you're just sitting there, the message comes maybe mm -hmm. that aren't women important in this because most of the things that he's mentioned are masculine. It's just an observation, mm -hmm. and uh, don't have any. Um, I would say it's just something that I, I would say to think about. Oh, I, 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 if, if yeah. I didn't know anything about you, I would say that your intent was to convince this group that when we're talking about religion, probably we should stay in the masculine. I just, uh, uh, I, I, I hope that this was not very generally conveyed, but that's what happens a lot in religions. So if you take the take of a Bakhtaman, uh, 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 Frederick Barth discusses that in, in some detail. It's, it's a men's religion, men's cult, uh, 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 of which the women are excluded. There are initiation systems which are strictly for males. Uh, uh, women, women are left out, uh, uh, and in so many ways, it's a, 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 you know, a, a, an instrument in these small societies of 183 people of masculine domination. Uh, uh, so yes, when you talk about religion, you end up talking more about, I didn't talk much about uh, anything concrete there, but you end up talking more about men because they're certainly, uh, on, on, in, in most religions of the world, have uh, uh, t you know, t taking, take, taken uh, uh, it upon them to, to control it uh, to, to, to a very, very large extent. For the rest, I, I, you know, I, I, I will be happy to stand correct if I've shown a, a sexist bias. I, uh, I, I hope I haven't, I, uh, but if I have, uh, thanks for pointing that, that out to me, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And one hears a lecture, and this to, to an extent to Rorschach. We talked about Little Red Riding Hood, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. in my that's, that's a woman, by the way. But in a sense, we all hear things rather differently. And the subsequent outputs, which in this case was a political statement, and I I guess the criticism of yourself as sexist of the lecture as masculine. Uh, this may be part of the process of uh, cultural perpetuation, mm -hmm. change, and, and modification. Yes, you're right. I, I, I thank you for your comment. Yes. Yes. In addition to uh, diversity, cross cultural diversity, I'm interested in cross cultural similarities. Mm -hmm. Of course it is. Look, look, but the, the uh, and you know, if uh, uh, among anthropologists, I stand as somebody who's uh, insisted on commonalities of human nature uh, much more than is generally accepted to people in, in, in the field. I think uh, uh, Norbert was alluding to that uh, when he, he was pointing out that my work is not exactly mainstream. 
uh, in, in, in the field. Uh, um, the, the, uh, in a sense, I take it so much for granted I didn't mention it. That is, well, it, it is striking, it is really striking that here is a, uh, an animal species, Homo sapiens, uh, uh, which produce so many radically different ways of uh, uh, being human. Uh, uh, no other species is at all comparable uh, in, in, in this respect. So, so, so I take for granted that indeed whatever humans do, they do in virtue of being the kind of animal they are, and, they are, and, and I also take for granted the uh, unity of, of, of humankind. It's, uh, 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 and that makes explaining uh, uh, diversity indeed a major task. If what is, uh, if you take the, the more standard anthropological relativist view, there's nothing to explain. It's, it's obvious. You start from that. You take it for granted that the human mind is uh, open to any kind of possibility, imposes no constraint on cultural variability and so on. So uh, that the variability should be there is, 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 it goes without saying. And it's interesting that there are some comparisons which bring some, you know, you find some regularity that are surprising. I'm not surprised by commonalities. I'm surprised by diversity. And I want indeed to, have to, to explain how, in spite of the unity, uh, uh, of, of, of the human brain, of, of, of the capacities we're all born with, uh, we end up uh, uh, developing such different uh, uh, cultural systems. One more question. Thank uh, you. Many years ago, I had a chance to study with Anthony Wallace, mm -hmm. an anthropologist. Yeah, sure. yeah. He wrote a book in 1966 on religion, which is very parallel mm -hmm. to some of your interests, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. never really took off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering who else is writing and thinking about this that uh, you find similar compatible with some of the Look, there are lots of people. Uh, it's a major, it's, uh, his is and has always been a major theme in anthropology. Uh, 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 and Wallace's book is one I remember reading and have in mind. It was, uh, so s some of the points I've, are made, for instance, uh, I think would be shared by most uh, uh, anthropologists, like for instance, the fact that it's a family resemblance notion and they're asking what is religion is not a good question. Uh, that, that was, uh, I presented that as a, a, a common anthropological wisdom, not something particularly original, still something that's worth uh, pointing out and arguing uh, uh, in, in many contexts. Uh, um, as, as I said, I, 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 the, the cognitive approach to religion uh, and uh, more the cognitive approach, uh, taking this naturalistic form uh, 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 rooted in the cognitive evolution, including uh, uh, an evolutionary perspective. Uh, we are a minority of people doing that. Uh, uh, a, a, a growing number. So, so, so but, but uh, I mentioned uh, Boyer, Atron, I, I could have mentioned Pilsian, and, and so a number of uh, uh, younger people who've uh, developed this kind of approach. Uh, 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 recently, and as I'm also mentioned approach which are different from the one I'm advocating, but which in, uh, relate in the same manner, uh, 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 and which take a more uh, kind of functionalist view. But but uh, um, I have the sense that there's a range of uh, new issues that are being addressed uh, 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 in a novel manner uh, uh, in, in the anthropological study of religion, uh, linking uh, the anthropological approach to the cognitive and the biological, and that this is fairly novel. And again, lots of people are proposing different versions of it, some of which I like, some I don't, but I like the, I like the conversation. <laughs>